Well, hello and welcome to this session in the PASS Virtual Summit 2020 experience. Today we're going to be talking about a deep dive on BI features of SQL Server on Amazon RDS. I'm Richard Waymeyer. I'm a Principal Product Manager on Amazon Web Services, and I'd like to introduce my co-presenter, Puya Amini, who's a Software Development Engineer for AWS. Puya, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Richard. So I'm a software engineer at Amazon and have been at Amazon for more than six years. Okay, so a couple of reminders about PASS. Uh, obviously there's lots and lots of, of resources and things to take advantage of with uh, the PASS community. I've been involved with the PASS community since the first summit. So i uh, been around a very long time with, with PASS and I'm very supportive of the, the SQL Server community experience of SQL Saturday and of all of these experiences. You absolutely want to take advantage of these to enhance your career and grow your, your knowledge and talents with all of the amazing resources available to you through PASS. Don't forget when you're done uh, viewing the session, uh, please submit an evaluation. The link will be available uh, from the PASS website and you've got until November 20th at five o'clock and of course there's incentives. All right, so again, I uh, already gave a brief introduction. Uh, I've been a, a long time SQL Server geek, uh, author, program and product manager, spent a few years at Microsoft, I've spent a few years now at Amazon and as Puyo just said, he's uh, been a developer for a number of years here at Amazon and, and several years before that at other companies and he's passionate about uh, developing with new technologies. So what we're going to talk about in this session is the business intelligence capabilities we've added this year to RDS SQL Server. So we've added the capability to run analysis services, integration services, and reporting services on this same physical instance as an RDS for SQL Server instance. So we're gonna talk about the implications of that, the, some limitations and some things you'll wanna be aware of as you go to deploy using these technologies and some of the both the, the general advantages and licensing advantages. And then we're gonna spend the majority of the time with Puya showing you exactly how all of this actually works and deploy a scenario with ISAS and RS up to a real SQL Server RDS instance. So first, a little bit about Amazon RDS. So RDS stands for Relational Database Service. It's a managed relational database service with a choice of six different database engines that you can run. We've got, uh, in the open source versions, we have MySQL and Postgres, as well as MariaDB. From a commercial perspective, we support both Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle. And then we have our home developed uh, system, Amazon Aurora, which has both MySQL and Postgres flavors. All of these databases have a few things in common that make them part of the RDS experience. And that's listed as these four tenants on the slide. So ease to administer, uh, secure and compliant, available and durable, and performance and scalability. So what do we mean by, by these tenants? Well, all of these engines are automated and running for you in the Amazon cloud. So we try to make them easy to deploy and maintain so you don't have to worry about hardware. You just tell us you wanna run an instance, for example, as you might expect, we're gonna talk a lot about SQL Server here today. So you wanna run an instance of SQL Server. You tell us run a SQL Server, I want this many CPUs and I'd like this much memory. And then we're gonna take care of that. We're gonna run all the hardware. We're gonna run the operating system. We're gonna run SQL Server. We're gonna help you monitor that. We're gonna make sure it stays healthy and we're gonna fix it if something goes wrong. From a security and compliance perspective, we're gonna give you options for data encryption at rest. So uh, you just check a box and say, yes, please encrypt all my data. And then we take care of it for you. Encryption in transit, fully supporting SSL on not just SQL Server, but all of our products here. Industry compliance and assurance programs. So any number of different compliance programs, all documented on our website, HIPAA, PCI, etc. Availability and durability. So uh, we do have automatic multi-AZ data replication. So what does that mean? Let's take just a minute and talk about this because it's a very important concept. In Amazon, when we think of high availability, we think of that as running across multiple physical data centers. So an availability zone is a minimum of one physical data center. So when we talk about our high availability scenario with multi-AZ, we mean we're gonna be running a copy of your database in a minimum of two completely separate physical data centers and replicating the data between them synchronously. 
So this will give you full failover capabilities, and it's all automated with a checkbox in the Amazon RDS console or a single API call asking us to turn that on. And then we maintain it for you. We give you full failover between those. And again, this is our HA strategy. If we want to talk about disaster recovery, then we're talking about going to a completely different region, like say between Oregon and Virginia. So that's when, when we talk about HA, we are always talking about multi-AZ. We provide automated backups, anything with up to one to 35 days, including log backups every five minutes. We can take manual or automated snapshots, and we support full failover both automatically and manually if you'd like to do that, as well as supporting read replicas for most of our database engines. And then finally, scaling and scaling both uh, compute and storage is absolutely trivial in AWS. You can uh, scale up or scale down within the limits of the supported application servers, everything from one or two CPUs up to 32, 64, or even 128 CPUs, depending on the engine, and up to four terabytes of RAM. So we have a tremendous amount of scalability, and it's quite literally, tell me you want to scale up, we'll take care of it. A few minutes later, you're scaled up. Tell me you want to scale down. A few minutes later, you're scaled down. And it's very, very straightforward to do. This really changes the way you think about how you build and deploy applications and environments because you don't have to think so much ahead. You can say, I don't know for sure what this environment's going to take for resources. So I could start, for example, at an R5 4XL. And if I'm wrong and I need more resources, I can double it and make it an R5 8XL. If I'm wrong and I, I don't use nearly as many resources, I thought I did, I could shrink it down to a 2XL. All that flexibility is just part of using RDS. And the exact same thing in the storage. If you guess wrong, you can shrink your volumes or resize the database. If you guess uh, wrong and you need it bigger, then you can just easily change that. And if you need more performance, you can just change it from general purpose storage to provisioned IOPS and get much more performance. So lots and lots of flexibility. All of that is built in standard to the RDS platform across all of these databases. Drilling into SQL Server, let's talk for a few minutes about RDS for SQL Server's capabilities. We currently support everything from SQL Server 2012 up through 2019 with Express Web Standard and Enterprise. You'll notice we don't offer developer edition experience. Uh, we don't have the, the option to, to license that. Um, we do have only license included, so you will need to buy the license with your instance. Again, there's nothing you need to negotiate or do anything with. It's just when you buy an instance of SQL Server from us, It'll include the license for Windows and SQL Server. The high availability is AWS managed, and you'll either get database mirroring for some editions or always on availability groups for others. It'll depend on the combination of the version of uh, software and whether you get standard or enterprise. From a security perspective, as I mentioned at the, at the outset, we uh, use our own key management service to provide encryption at rest. So you check a box and say, yes, please encrypt it and then uh, specify a key. You can bring your own keys uh, or you can use SQL Server's native TDE capabilities. And we provide encryption in transit with SSL and even force SSL, uh, just like you could with an on-prem SQL Server. From an authentication perspective, we support both Windows and SQL Auth. We do support Windows Auth only through using a Microsoft managed Active Directory service in AWS. From there, you can set up a forest trust back into your domain so that you can use your Windows accounts. But we do require the machine accounts for RDS SQL Server to exist in a Microsoft managed Active Directory service offering from AWS. And that'll be important for all of the BI capabilities we're gonna talk about. Backup and recovery is automated on RDS for SQL Server. I guess it's more accurate to say backups are automated. Recovery will always be manual on your part if you need to recover to say a point in time. Recovery of the service itself is automated. So if for example, there was some kind of outage and, uh, and uh, things crashed, we will uh, bring that back up automatically for you and get the service back up and running. If you need to restore to a previous point in time or something like that, we'll have the backups, we'll have the T-log backups, you can restore those yourself. And you can take your own native SQL Server backups in addition to the automated system backups. They're compatible with each other. From a maintenance perspective, we'll take care of patching SQL Server for you. We have a shared responsibility model, model on how we think about both security and software development here. So we're going to provide the security and, and experience in the cloud, and then the stuff running on top of that is going to be your responsibility. 
maintaining Windows, maintaining SQL Server, in general, that's going to be Amazon's responsibility. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to force you to upgrade, for example, to a new version of SQL Server, but it does mean, for example, if a critical Windows security patch comes out, we're going to take care of that for you. And then the new thing that we've added this year that we wanted to talk about here at PASS is the BI features. So integration services, analysis services, and reporting services have been added as capabilities in the RDS platform. So let's then drill into those BI features of SQL Server, talk a little bit about them, and then we'll talk about specifically how they work on RDS. So BI is nothing more than taking data and turning it into information. So the BI capabilities of SQL Server, whether they be built into the relational engine, and of course there are features of this that are natively in the relational engine, are about taking that data and exposing it to customers. The BI capabilities, ISAS and RS, are about taking that a step further and giving us additional options to get that data and turn it into information. A BI data lifecycle frequently looks something like this. You'll grab your data out of a SQL server or from other data sources. You'll use the SSIS capabilities to extract, transform, and load. And sometimes you'll extract, load, and transform, just depending on your philosophy on these things. Get that data into a format we want to use. Generally speaking, again, probably going to land that uh, for in the case of, of what we're working on here in a SQL server. We're going to take some uh, some workload transformations there and turn that into an analysis services capability with uh, a, a tabular data cube is what we're going to support right now on uh, RDS for SQL Server, or you could do a multi-dimensional cube on top of this data as well, but we just don't support that uh, natively, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. And reporting is then built on top of both the analysis services cubes and the native relational data, and that reporting data is then exposing information like dashboards for end customers. So again, this is directly mapping into the capabilities offered by Microsoft SQL Server. All right, let's drill then uh, a step further into the various individual capabilities. We're going to start with SSIS, SQL Server Integration Services. So integration services is built on top of a, a mechanism of a, an SSIS package, and that package is going to then be stored internally in the case of RDS for SQL Server in the SSIS database on the RDS SQL Server instance. So what you're seeing in this picture is a screenshot from uh, a SQL Server Management Studio expansion of an RDS SQL Server instance. And you see, uh, you can tell that generally speaking just by looking at the list of databases, you see RDS Admin, that's the administration database uh, uh, that's always present on an RDS for SQL Server instance. Well, in this case, we've also installed SSIS. So there's an SSIS database as well. And I see here that the user is going to, for example, create an SSIS package. And again, Puya is going to demonstrate all of this in a few minutes. Uh, he's going to then deploy uh, that package uh, through the catalog. That's going to get stored into the SSIS database onto the RDS SQL Server instance. And then you can execute that package once it's been uploaded. In that catalog, we're going to have an a SSIS package. That SSIS package is going to grab some data sources. It's going to put those uh, data sources and into the SSIS catalog. And then when that uh, package actually runs, that package is going to then clean and transform the data. That's generally speaking what we want to do with SSIS. And then push that data out to various destinations. Now we do, as you might expect, support pushing data into SQL Server, but you can also push it into other data sources such as a CSV file or XML. And if you noticed on the left, we also supported file inputs as well. And, and we'll explain a little bit more about that. In that SSIS database, we have a couple of administrator roles that you need to be aware of. So when you first log in and add the capabilities of SSIS into your RDS for SQL Server instance, you're going to log in as the master user from RDS SQL Server. Now that's a standard security user, so you're not going to be able to use that for actually working with SSIS packages. You're going to have to use Windows authenticated users. So in the example here, you see I'm going to log in as the master user, and then I'm going to go ahead and grant permissions to a couple of domain users so that they can be the administrators of SSIS. So you see there's two roles here listed on the left side of the slide, SSIS admin 
and SSIS Log Reader. SSIS Admin gives me the ability to execute a package, delete a package, create and delete folders, create and delete environments, but can't actually deploy the projects on RDS SQL Server. And then SSIS Log Reader will give you the ability to query the tables that give the package execution details. There's a completely separate set of permissions that we'll assign uh, to actually deploy the projects, uh, and we're gonna demonstrate that. And uh, you can also find that both in blog posts that have been written about how this works and in our documentation. So in this case, for example, my master user of SSISDB will, will log in, and for domain one SSIS user could grant SSIS admin, and SSIS log reader. And over here for domain user SSIS user two, we give them SSIS admin, but not necessarily log reader privileges. So that's the way we would set up the basic administration. So now these two users are, are going to be able to administer SSIS on the RDS for SQL Server instance. Once you've got that configured, here's sort of a list of things to think about uh, from both a feature perspective and a dependency perspective. I'm not gonna try and explain SSIS completely to you. That I think uh, most people that, that are, are gonna be in this audience either will already know about that or will uh, be able to learn about that from other sessions here at PASS. What I wanna talk about is some of the limitations and dependencies that we have for SSIS when it's running on RDS for SQL Server. So you can add SSIS to a new or existing database instance. So if you don't have SSIS turned on right now, you can just go enable it. Uh, you can uh, therefore run SSIS side by side with an RDS SQL Server relational database instance. Now, why would you do that? Because you wanna save money. So when you are licensing uh, RDS SQL Server, you're also licensing all those BI components. And if you install them on the same computer, they run under the same SQL Server license. You can still run IS, AS, and RS on an EC2 host, for example, it's just another name for a virtual machine running in the AWS cloud, and connect up to your RDS SQL Server instance just like you could any other uh, relational database source, but that would require a separate license of the BI capabilities on that EC2 host. If you run it here on the same computer as RDS for SQL Server, then you combine the licenses. You can run this on a, on a RDS for SQL Server that's either single AZ or multi AZ. So it does support uh, being in a high availability configuration. Uh, we do take care of the database master key and password for SSIS. So we'll take care of that for you. And uh, if something bad happens, for example, like the, the underlying host computer is replaced, you won't lose the master key. We've created a local directory on the hard drive for RDS. So normally in a managed instance, we wouldn't let you uh, play with uh, files on the hard drive of the server. But in this case, for the BI components, we needed to give you a home on the local computer, for example, to upload files and work with them uh, to do SSS transforms using those files as sources or targets. So in this case, the D colon S3 directory on your RDS instance is available uh, to uh, work with uh, for loading uh, local files or pushing or pulling from there. If you disable SSIS, you can then re-enable it. So it's just a configuration parameter for your RDS SQL Server instance. And if you do turn it off and then turn it back on again, you can reuse the SSIS DB uh, database. We won't automatically delete it unless you tell us to. We support SQL Server 2016 and 2017 standard in enterprise. The database instance has to use the managed Microsoft Active Directory service. I mentioned that before, and keep in mind that doesn't mean you have to put your user accounts in the managed Active Directory. We absolutely support setting up a forest trust back to your existing Active Directory infrastructure. It's that we need the machine accounts for the RDS instances to exist in that managed Active Directory. You can't deploy projects that in Visual Studio that you build for SSIS directly onto uh, the RDS for SQL Server instance. We have to uh, validate the project and then we push it up using a stored procedure. And again, Puya is gonna demonstrate this. And we do have a limited subset of the control flow tasks that are allowed when they're running on the RDS SQL Server instance. And we limit you to that one directory I told you that we've added the, the S3 directory on the D drive to, to be able to put and push, pull and push uh, data files. 
All right, let's shift gears a bit and talk about analysis services. So in analysis services, you only currently have the option of running analysis services on RDS in tabular mode. So again, no restrictions on new versus existing instances. You can add AS at any time. Uh, and again, the same reasoning applies in terms of uh, saving you on licensing costs. You can back up and restore SSAS databases on your RDS instance. Uh, we do support 2016 and 2017 standard and enterprise, and we have the same caveats about the managed Active Directory service, but there's a few more limitations around analysis services. We only support using SSAS on port 2383. That is uh, a hard requirement for analysis services if you're gonna run it on the RDS for SQL Server instance. You don't get admin access to the server because we restrict that to keep the service managed. And that includes SSAS admin access. You get database level admin access, but not server level. You can't deploy your tabular analysis services using XMLA files. You have to, again, follow a procedure which we will demonstrate in a few minutes. Again, we've got that, that folder that we're gonna let you use uh, for file output. And, and an important caveat here is analysis services is only supported on single AZ instances. So you cannot use analysis services on a multi-AZ configuration. If you need to do that, then you would have to fall back on running analysis services on EC2. And finally, let's talk about reporting services. So in SQL Server reporting services, if you've ever deployed reporting services, you know you get two databases. You get a report server and a report server tempdb database on your SQL Server. Well, you get exactly the same thing here, except we call them RDS admin underscore and then report server and report server tempdb. We'll also host the web portal on the SQL Server instance, uh, as you'd expect. And you see in our example, uh, end users can have reports published from, for example, Visual Studio. Those reports can feed from data in the RDS for SQL Server instance or from an analysis services uh, cube. Uh, the report metadata is stored in these RDS admin uh, report server databases. And uh, for example, temporary copies of the generated reports would be in the TEPDB uh, database there. RDS admin report server database is gonna have all the users and roles, uh, notifications, report metadata, data source information, and execution logs that you would get for reporting services. And the report server attempt to be, as I mentioned before, is gonna have the execution cache, content cache, and other temporary data used to support reporting services. So you do need both of those databases. This again is available on all the new and existing database instances of RDS for SQL Server. Uh, and has the same licensing motivations. We do take care of managing the encryption keys and we will auto configure SSRS in the event of a failover between availability zones. Unlike analysis services, you can use a custom port and you can disable and enable SSRS as we uh, mentioned before with, uh, with uh, some of the other options. Uh, it will uh, leave the SSRS databases there if you want to uh, temporarily turn the service features off and then back on again. We do support SSL encrypted connections to the portal and you can tweak the amount of maximum memory you can use for RDS uh, for uh, reporting services compared to using RDS. Just be careful that you don't starve the machine of memory for SQL Server itself. And again, this is supported on 2016 or 2017 standard and enterprise, has to use the Microsoft Managed Active Directory. We don't support uh, email or Windows file share subscriptions for reports. And we don't support the reporting services configuration manager. You manage this entirely through uh, the RDS user experience. And we don't grant you, again, system administrator rights. You, you get the, the privileges you would have from being an RDS manager. And then the configuration options we expose to you through the configuration parameters for RDS for SQL Server. With that, I want to turn it over to Puglia, and he can demonstrate how all of these capabilities integrate directly into RDS for SQL Server. Thank you, Richard. Let me share my screen. This is my AWS console, and I want to show how to deploy and execute SSIS, SSAS, and SSRS project. Uh, my assumption is most of uh, the folks here are already familiar with these services, so I don't go into details of you know these services. There are a lot of you know online resources uh, to look deeper into the services. However, in this time, I want to show how to deploy uh, the projects on uh, MSBI on RDS. 
I've created uh, some instances and some configuration that I want to quickly describe here. On my RDS instance, I've created uh, two sample instances. So I'm waiting to load. There's going to be two databases. One of them is SourceDB. It's basically a SQL Server Standard Edition 2016. Uh, I put AdventureWorks 2014, and I'm going to use uh, this instance as a source database. Uh, in reality, it can be any databases. It can be on-prem databases. Here, I use uh, an RDS database. And we have uh, another database, Demo BI database, that I use to deploy my MSBI projects. Basically, uh, this instance is part of the Manage Active Directory. I'm going to show the Active Directory later. If we go to option groups, there is one option group for the source DB. There is only one option, SQL Server Backup Restore, that I use to import AdventureWorks 2014. And the option group for my uh, BI instance has all the BI components. We have SSIS, and we have SSRS on port 8000. So it's a, basically a custom port. For SSIS, the only acceptable port, as Richard mentioned, is 2383, which is default port for SSIS. And also, I enable SQL Server Backup Restore as well. I have another AdventureWork 2014 I, on this instance to import it. I use SQL Server Backup Restore as well. Also, I enable S3 integration on this instance because to be able to transfer files, uh, the project file to the instance, I need to uh, enable S3 integration and move my file to one S3 bucket and from the S3 bucket to my RDS instance. Going to the S3, this is the bucket uh, I created uh, for my demo, is BI demo and test. And I configured uh, to use S3 integration for this one. Uh, to know how you can configure S3 integration on a specific bucket, please uh, take a look at AWS documentation documentation. There are a lot of you know details instruction how to configure, how to create uh, buckets, how to use S3 integration. And also going to my directory. So there is one single uh, managed active directory that I created, uh, which is the name msbi.amazon.com. Uh, my BI RDS instance is part of this domain. Also, the, the screen that you are seeing here, it's on another EC2 instance. So on my EC2, there is one single instance that I'm running the demo on. The main thing is this instance is also part of the MSBI Active Directory domain. Uh, on the same domain as you saw, we have like uh, the RDS instance for the BI project as well. Now everything is set, uh, let's go to the project. I've created some sample project for SSIS, SSAS, and SSRS. Starting with SSIS, there is a very simple project that gets data from the source DB and uh, you know joins to table and uh, create a table on the destination and move data there. So if we go to source DB, uh, this is the source DB. And also, I join two tables of the person and you know salesperson together. You can see a preview of data here. So this is a preview. And on the destination, you can see it puts the data in a table called SSIS demo. In my uh, SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio, I connected to my source DB. As you can see, there's, uh, there is only one database, AdventureWorks 2014, that I imported through SQL Server Backup Restore. 
And I'm going to connect to my BI demo instance. Basically, I want to get the endpoint for, from my instance. It's basically EC2. I'm going to RDS. I get the endpoint from here. And uh, for, for deploying the BI project, we need to use Windows authentication. And you can see the username is actually admin user on the MSBI domain that we saw earlier. So under the databases, there is another adventure book 2014. And there is a table called SSIS demo that uh, the SSIS project gonna use to put the data in SSIS demo. If we quickly see, there is nothing in that table. As Richard explained, uh, we cannot directly deploy SSIS project to the audience instance, and we, we need to use um, S3 integration. However, before that, there is uh, some configuration that you need to follow. So the first one is protection level. So you right click on the project, go to properties, and change the protection level to do not save sensitive data. You need to do the same thing on the control flow tab. You right click, you go to properties, and you change to change protection level to do not save sensitive data. If you use data flow, uh, there are some other values that you need to set. Again, right click, go to properties. There are two values here, blob temp storage pass that needs to be set to D column S3 backslash. The other one is the same thing. Basically, once you enable S3 integration, S3 integration will create a folder on your RDS instance on the D drive called S3. You have access into that folder. So basically, through every file that you put uh, on, on your S3 bucket, you can move it to S3 folder. And your SSIs can use that S3 folder to get the files. And if your SSIs project outputs any file, it outputs to that S3 folder. And again, you can use S3 integration to transfer files from your audience instance to your S3 bucket. So once you do you do that, uh, you can build the project here. The build is successful, and it will output a project file that I'm going to use S3 integration to move it to RDS instance. Going back to my S3 bucket, I'm going to upload the SSIS project file. Now the SSIS project file is on my S3 bucket. I need to move it to my RDS instance. I'm already connected to my RDS instance. To run the query, I have a file that has all the commands needs to run on SSIS. The first command is basically a store procedure to download the file from S3 bucket to the RDS instance. So this is my bucket name, BI demo test. And this is the file that I just uploaded to my S3 bucket. And it's going to be on the S3 folder on the D drive on the RDS instance. I execute this store procedure. It gives me a task ID. That task ID is being used to track the status of that task. So right now, it's in the created state. We have to wait until the lifecycle changes to successful 
after it's being successful, it means that the SPAC file is on my RDS instance. So just need to pass task ID here. And I run this command to see my updated you know, status of my task. So right now it's still in a created state. Uh, there are lots of uh, other fields that you can see uh, for this specific task. It's a task type is download from S3, uh, you know, the com completion percentage and the duration. If for some reason there are some issues or uh, some information regarding your task, uh, that information would be available under the task underline info. There are, you know, information about when the task has been created, the last time that has been updated. Uh, probably once you run it on your instance, the, ta the task ID would be much lower because I use uh, this instance for demoing. I ran a lot of tasks and it gives me the task ID 74. So now it's, it's still in progress. From the create, uh, it changed to in progress. It means that uh, the false uh, is under the progress to being transferred from my S3 bucket to the RDS instance. Once uh, the, the file is my RDS instance, I can run another store procedure to basically deploy my SSIS project to, uh, to SSIS. Okay. Now the test is successful, meaning I, uh, that file is on my instance. To be able to uh, run and to deploy the project, we need to pass a folder name. If you look at the integration service catalogs, there is only one folder called sample folder. If I want to deploy my project in a folder called sample, I need to create a folder here. I just put a description like, Sample folder. Now the folder is being created. And I can just run this command to deploy my SSI's project. It gives me task ID of 75. So I pass here just to track my task. As execution might take time, I've already deployed a very similar project in another folder called sample folder. And there's a project called SSI's demo there. Um, I just want to execute this package. Basically, it does the same thing. It fills the SSIS demo table with data from the uh, my source DB. In my connection manager, I need to update the password to connect to the source DB and also to destination DB. This is my destination DB, it's my uh, demo instance. So I add the password. The same thing for my source DB, uh, to be able that the project being connected to my source DB and uh, fetch the data. Because this is a very simple project, the execution is pretty quickly. And it says uh, the execution is successful, meaning that if I check my uh, SSI demo table, it should have some data. Basically, it joins two tables from my source DB and output it in a, in a table called SSI demo. Going back to my sort procedure, I'm tracking uh, my previous task. And now it says success. Going back to uh, my catalog, if I refresh the SSI DB, there should be a project, my SSI project under the folder sample. And then you can do the same thing basically uh, to execute the project. 
but before that you need to update you know the password for the source and um, destination databases let's go to ssas analysis services again uh the mode that we're supporting for SSS is tabular. So I created a very simple tabular project based on AdventureWorks database. Uh, it gives me a couple of tables. I created the measure and KPI metrics. And I need to deploy the project to my RDS instance to be able to execute it. The scenario of deployment and execution is very similar to SSIS. You cannot directly uh, deploy through Visual Studio data tools. You need to uh, build a project and put the project files to RDS instance through S3 integration. Before that, again, there are some configuration that you need to make. On the Solution Explorer, if you right-click on the project, processing option, uh, is set to default the first time that you create the project. It means that once uh, you deploy a project, it it's automatically uh, does triggers the processing. But we don't want to do that. We do not allow processing right after deployment. So we change it to do not process. One other thing, we use a Windows authenticated user. However, we need to define a role and assign that specific Windows authenticated user to this project. Otherwise, even if the project is being deployed, that user is not able to see the project. So under the roles sections, you can see the roles and there is no roles here. I just want to create a new one called, uh, for example, admin role. I'm gonna give admin uh, permission to that role. And for the member, I just want to use my Windows authenticated user to add it to that role. Now I'm able to build a project and move the project files into my RDS instance. For the SSIS project, three files has been generated, uh, AS database file, deployment options, and deployment targets. However, we just need AS database and deployment options because uh, the targets is the default target of local host, and we don't uh, allow basically targets other than the local host. So we, we only accept uh, the first two files. Going back to my S3 bucket, I upload both files here. This is for my SSIS, I close it. As these files are in my S3 bucket, I'm gonna follow the same scenario here using S3 integration. I have another bunch of commands for SSAS. Basically the first two commands uh, you saw it before, download a file from S3 bucket and put it in S3 folder on my RDS instance. And this specific case is model.as uh, database and model by deployment options. And again, it gives me task ID, one task ID per task. Uh, I'm gonna track the latest task is 77. And after that, after I have both files in my RDS instance, I can use another sort procedure to deploy project, uh, deploy SSAS project using the, mod, the model.as database. As Richard mentioned, uh, currently we don't support deployment through XMLA file here. Yeah. 
during the uh, creation of the project, I added um, an admin member. I created a role called admin role and I assigned my Windows authenticated user. In any case, if you forget to add a role or add a member to that role, we have created another sort of procedure that you can basically through that you can create a role, an admin role. You can pass the, the name of the role and you can pass the member. Uh, in that case, it creates a role, assign that member, and that member has admin permission to that specific project. Here is called like SSS project. Going back to the file, it's in progress yet. So it's going to take a couple of more seconds so that the files are available on my RDS instance. And after that, I'm going to trigger the SSS uh, deploy project store procedure. To be able to work with SSAs, you need to connect to your database. However, instead of database engine, so you need to use analysis services. And the rest of the thing is the same. It's the name of the server. And then the only available option here is using Windows authentication. As you see, there is only one database here, SSA's demo that I uh, created before the session uh, so that I show you how to uh, execute like a project, SSA's project. Once we deploy this project, it's going to uh, be a new database called SSA's project underneath of uh, the databases. OK. So the task number 77 is successful. Number 76 should be successful as well. Just to double check here, yes, it's successful as well. Meaning that uh, both model.as database and model.deployment options are already on my RDS instance. So I'm able to trigger a sort procedure to deploy my SSS project. Again, I pass the task ID here. And right now, it's in uh, created a state. It's going to go to in progress and then successful after that. Uh, however, um, as I mentioned, I already have one SSS uh, demo project here. I just want to use it to show how to execute the project. Again. Uh, there is information about the you know, uh, connection string to my source instance. I need to update it to pass the password to connect to the source instance. It's connected. Test connection is successful. I can now just uh, trigger the process. For this one, uh, the processing shouldn't take that much because the number of uh, you know tables that we're going to import is not that many. However, if your uh, source DB is very large and you want to analyze a large amount of data, you might expect even uh, you know hours that the processing time takes. Uh, here, I expect that it's it's finishing in a minute or two. Ex successful, meaning that we already have data on my SSA's demo table. I can quickly browse it. You can see like the data here. I can pass uh, like the measure I created here. I can, you know, pass uh, other dimensions. Um, I know, like, Yeah, maybe it's not the best dimension to put, but uh, you give an idea. Coming back to uh, my task, 78. 
is successful, meaning that now we should have another table called SSAS project under the databases, actually another database called SSAS project. And here, so it's gonna be the same thing. So you can, again, you know, go there, update the connection string, Gonna make sure that they pass the right password. It's successful. And then uh, you can trigger process. There are other store procedure here uh, that uh, we don't have time to actually uh, execute them, but uh, other than one store procedure to uh, to be able to add an admin role and add a member to that, there is another store procedure to take a backup of your SSS database. And when you take a backup, it put the backup on S3 folder on the D drive. I'm gonna quickly show the script here. So uh, it's SSS backup DB, you pass the name of the project, your database, and then you pass the name of the backup file that you want to put on S3 folder. Uh, if you want to restore SSS database, again, you pass uh, the backup file uh, that probably you have used S3 integration to move that backup file to S3 folder on the D drive. And then you pass the database that you want to uh, restore under that name. Uh, if we already have one SSAS project with the same name, we don't allow restoring the SSS database. So it has to be a different name. Last but not least, let's go to SSRS project. Here is um, another, you know, simple SSRS project based on, again, AdventureWorks. Um, the difference between deployment uh, uh, from you know, SSR is comparing to AS and IS is you can directly deploy the project to uh, your RDS instance. Once you deploy the project to your RDS instance, you should be able to uh, see your SSRS project here uh, through the web portal. And to access to your web portal, basically uh, the only supported mode is HTTPS, Let's go back to the RDS instances. I wanna grab the endpoint for my uh, BI database. Basically use HTTPS, the endpoint of the database, and then the port that you specified. So here for this demo, the port uh, I use in my option group is 8,000. So basically it's gonna be, let's open a new tab. And reports. Currently, our Windows user doesn't have access to the portal. There is another store procedure in order to give the user permission to see the portal. Um, let's open the commands for SSRS. And this is our procedure gives uh, permission to my Windows authenticated user here, MSBI admin, to be able to see the portal. Uh, the scenario is uh, the same as a previous scenario that you saw. There is a task, there is a task ID. You need to pass the task ID here in order to track the task. And once uh, the task is done, is in successful state, my Windows authenticated user is able to see the portal. For SSRS projects, so there is, uh, there are actually two ways to deploy your project into uh, your RDS instance. One of them is, uh, as I mentioned, directly through uh, Visual Studio Data Tools. The other one is uh, the output file, the RDF file. You can directly upload it through web portal. I'm gonna show both ways here. First of all, I, I'm gonna wait uh, for my task to be executed. 
Right now, I give permission to my uh, Windows authenticated user. There is another test to revoke that permission. In, in future, you decide that you don't want to give access, uh, portal access to any uh, like Windows authenticated user. You can run this command to ensure that that user doesn't have permission to the portal. Yeah, sometimes it takes time um, so that the task is being kicked off. Right now, its life cycle is in created state, so I'm waiting it to be in progress and then successful. One thing I'm going to emphasize again is uh, the SSRS is using uh, the uh, the only like acceptable protocol is HTTPS. So you need to import an Amazon RDS certificate on the client instance. There are a lot of you know uh, details instruction on AWS documentation to see how you can import an Amazon RDS certificate so that you can uh, you are able to access to uh, the SSRS portal through HTTPS protocol. Okay, so the task is successful. I should be able to see the portal now. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, one project that uh, I deployed previously. I just want to delete it so that uh, it's not confusing for you. Again here, um, I build a project and going to the properties i specified the target server url so it's basically https the endpoint of uh, my instance the port number and then at the end we pass the report server let's just uh, let's just deploy the project deployment is successful now i can see the project I can update the connection string if we want. So let's go here. Um, on the data sources, I update the connection string. Right now, every time I want to create a report, it asks me for credentials. I don't want to do that. Uh, I just want to pass the credential once to access the source DB to be able to always uh, see the report without entering my username and password. This connection is successful, saved. Uh, going back to the project, I click on sales order, and, I build, and I'm able to see my report. Uh, on the second approach, let's again uh, delete this one. I use the web portal directly to upload my project. It's basically sales order dot RDL. And then I can do the same thing for data sources, data sources. I pass my credential to access the source DB. Successful. Now I'm able to see the report. Um, that was it for the demos. We now know that how to deploy and execute uh, projects for SSIS, SSAS, and SSRS. Um, there are a lot of, you know, maybe details about uh, those specific uh, offering on RDS instances that uh, I was asked you to follow up the instruction on our blog post regarding each service and our AWS documentation. I just want to pass it back to Richard uh, for the final notes. Thank you. Thanks, Puya. In summary, AS, IS, and RS are now available for RDS for SQL Server. You can run those on your existing or a new instance of RDS for SQL Server, and you no longer have to pay for that extra copy uh, of SQL Server running on EC2. You can run it on the same computer to optimize 
with your licensing. So that'll save licensing costs and provide better manageability and uh, provide managed service offerings for the BI components in addition to the relational database. If you want to get started with that, you can follow the link here in the slides. We'd be happy to uh, help you with that. All right, with that, again, thank you for attending today. Uh, uh, again, uh, you can reach out to me at waymeyer at amazon.com or puya at amipuya at amazon.com. We'd be happy to answer your questions. Thanks so much.